Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Do me a huge favor. Uh, be sure to subscribe, you know, if you're on YouTube or you're listening to this on a podcast or uh, where, wherever you're, you're watching or listening. Make sure you subscribe to receive more great content like this. And be sure to smash that like button, leave a comment, let me know what you think of the content that we're going to be reviewing today. Uh, so that way I can structure this channel more to be in line with what you would like to see. Today's interview is all about best practices for access control. And who better to discuss this topic with than the worldwide leaders in access control technology, HID. Whether it's cards or vertex panels or Edge Evo, and now with their recent acquisition of Mercury Security, HID is unquestionably one of the thought leaders in this space, and I had the privilege of speaking with Tim Gilger, who is the Director of Global Accounts for HID, Paul Russell, who is the Strategic Accounts Manager at HID, so he manages relationships like uh, with OEM partners like Genetech, and Jeremy Fromm, who is the Business Development Manager at Mercury Security, which is now part of HID Global. I structured this interview to start with best practices for credential technology, right? So the whole idea was to go from the credential, from the edge, all the way through to the reader, then to the wiring, and then to the panels. Uh, by the end of this, you should hopefully have a much better and clearer understanding of what your organization should be doing to keep these systems as secure as possible and have a, a great idea as to how to migrate your posture uh, if you're not already doing these best practices. So sit back, relax, and prepare yourselves for a great interview with my friends at HID Global. Okay, so as promised, here is Team HID. Uh, why don't you guys go around the go around the horn here and introduce yourself, starting with Paul. Thanks, Phil. Paul Russell, um, Strategic Accounts Manager here at HID, uh, managing responsible for our OEM relationships, such as uh, that of Genetech here in North America. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Hey, Phil, I'm Tim Gilger. I am the Director of Global Accounts, uh, responsible for the commercial partnership between HID and Genetech globally. Great, thanks. Hey, Phil, I'm Jeremy from. I'm with HID's controller business, so I'm looking after all controllers, including uh, Mercury and Vertex, and uh, I manage the Genetech account for North America and Canada. Great. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining. All right. And you know what, guys? That's actually a fantastic place to start because I've got two folks from HID, one guy from HID, but he's wearing a Mercury shirt. So why don't we sort of address that a little bit, right? So Mercury, HID, what happened? So uh, the, the, a merger took place at some point, right? Yeah, so back in 2018, the very end of 2018, HID made an acquisition and uh, purchased Mercury Security. So we fall under the, the HID umbrella now. Uh, we are now managing all of the controller business for HID. So there's uh, Mercury, there's Vertex, there's the Edge Evo controllers, and there'll soon be a new controller line uh, that HID has called HID Air in the future. Ooh, sneak peek. Uh, so so you you actually manage the Vertex line as well? I do. That's interesting. Correct. Very interesting. Cool. Well, um, sort of like I described in, in the intro, uh, I, wanna, I want this conversation to be not super salesy, not really about like Genetech per se, although we can, you know, that's my job. I wear the Genetech shirt, so I'll, uh, I'll try to sneak in as many product placements as possible. Uh, but what I really want this to be about is demystifying a lot of things as it pertains to best practices in access control. And where I want to start off specifically is with OSDP. Because this is like one of the biggest misconceptions. I, I feel like another misconception is just like uh, card and credential technology. And I want to have a robust conversation about why you cannot buy prox cards anymore. Please stop buying prox cards. Now, you want to buy those prox cards from Genetech? Okay, I understand. But uh, please, no, no more prox cards. Uh, so let's start uh, the conversation with OSDP. And for those of you that are following me on LinkedIn, 
Uh, you'll see a few days ago, I posted a poll, like my first ever poll, LinkedIn finally released or re-released their poll feature. And the question that I asked to my uh, 3,200 some odd followers on LinkedIn, uh, if you're not following me, it's uh, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash P Coppola, uh, is if you had to think about your access control installs in 2020 thus far, uh, where May 28th is of the recording of this video, 2020, how many of those installs you did weakened versus OSDP? And shockingly, but not shockingly, 63% of respondents said zero to 10% of their installs were with OSDP, which means the majority, 63% of them are weakened. And only 16% said more than 75% of their installs were OSDP. And I want to read you guys some of the comments, too, that, that some of these folks have made, because I think these comments are indicative of why the adoption of OSDP uh, has sort of uh, gone stale or stagnant. So uh, um, Brinton says, uh, I'm working to convert existing customers to OSDP, so that's great, you know, thumbs up there. Any new projects are RS-45 or OSDP. Integrators or security professionals must look to protect their customers from all vulnerabilities. If you're not moving forward with technology and protecting them, you're not really doing your job. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree with that sentiment more. Uh, here's another one from Chad Olson. Widespread adoption and awareness just isn't there for OSDP. It's up to vendors and installers to push awareness and offer solutions. But unfortunately, the status quo, if it works, don't fix it. Right. And I, I feel like that's sort of like in the conversations that I've had with even some of my integration partners, they're very much in this same vein. Like it's not broken. Our guys know weekend guys and gals doing the, the physical installations. But they know the wiring. They know the protocol. Why change? But in 2020, what that really means is an access control system that is heavily predicated on securing facilities is having technology installed on it for security that was developed in the 1980s. And I think we can all agree that uh, technology that was built in the 80s is nowhere near where it should be from an encryption and cybersecurity perspective um, to house anybody's information in, in 2020. So I want to I want to really sort of put the OSDP thing to bed and, and really I want to like use this to kill Wiegand protocol, please. So let, let's start there. So Paul, OSDP versus Wiegand, what's the difference? Uh, there's two primary uh, benefits I think OSDP versus Wiegand. One is you're, secure, you're securing the conversation between the reader and the panel, right? We're going to get into a little later, Phil, you mentioned we're going to talk about credential technology and demystifying some of that. That's really what I call like the front door of the house. This is really what I refer to as the back door of the house, securing, encrypting that conversation between the reader and the panel, because you can use any credential technology you want, but if you're not addressing the back end, uh, there is still an uh, opportunity for nefarious intent. Uh, there are devices, things available that assist in sniffing that communication. So one is security, uh, what's called secure channel delivered through O2. Secondly is that bi-directional communication. So it delivers the ability to push down and make changes to the reader dynamically uh, from the head end, providing a lot of benefits and efficiency for an installer or integrator in the field. Right. And it's that OSDP version two that, you know, Genetech is is leading with, and I'm sure some of your OEM partners um, are also, you know, banging their hands on the table. Must be version two because version two is where the secure channel comes from. Um, yeah, so Jeremy, uh, OSDP V2. What's the V2? What's secure channel? Yeah, so so V2 OSDP is really a living uh, protocol. Uh, so V2. I believe v2 one dot or v2 one seven is the latest version um, and it expands. So there's different profiles within OSDP. So you have a secure channel and non secure channel. There's some other profiles as well. Um, so I guess one misconception that I often hear is that v2 is only secure channel and that's not the case. You can have v2 and have it be unencrypted. 
So when we talk about secure channel, though, uh, really what we're doing is there's uh, bi-directional communication between your peripheral device, such as a reader and the controller, and uh, they establish a secure way of transmitting portions of the key, and they create a unique session key uh, to encrypt all of their data. And each reader and controller pair does that uh, encryption piece uh, and create their own unique session key. So every reader that you have throughout your building would have its own unique key. And the, the nice thing about this is if somebody were to pull a reader uh, off the wall and try to reverse engineer it, and let's say they they were really smart and they broke that encryption, uh, they would have only broken that encryption or figured out those keys for that specific reader. It wouldn't be for every other reader around the building. So they would have to get lucky again every single time, unless they knew how to break AES-128, which is really, really difficult to do. Exactly. And so let's let's take a step back there. What are the risks to going weakened? right now right so if somebody were to pull that reader off the wall today on a weekend based system what potentially could happen yeah so with with weekend there's simple sniffers uh that can be used uh so the sniffers uh black hat created one a handful of years ago back in the um mid 2010s 2014 2015 time frame and uh, they call that the BLE key. So really what you can do is you can pull a reader off the wall. With Wiegand, typically nobody wires uh, the tamper wires, so nobody knows that that reader is being pulled off the wall uh, from a, a centralized management point through Synergist, let's say. Um, and they'll punch down this little tiny sniffing device that can read the data going across the Wiegand wires. So it's really just zeros and ones, it's bits. And that device has Bluetooth low energy on it. It can connect to a phone and you can see that data go through in real time. So if you can see the data, you can also replay the data. And that's the vulnerability is somebody puts this uh, device in, they see the data come through, they replay that data, that card format data, and then the door opens bypassing the card in the reader. And there's other devices out there. There's been improvements. There's a device called the ESP key. Uh, that's from a, another group, a consulting group, a hacking group, um, ethical hacking group. And that's a really nice device. It comes with an embedded web page. It broadcasts a SSID for Wi-Fi. So it's incredibly simple to use. Um, I purchased one myself to test it, and I was able to install it, see the data, do a replay attack, and open the door uh, through one of these sniffing devices in less than five minutes. Wow. Wow. So, and and it should be mentioned here, so when a credential is presented to the reader in a Wiegand uh, situation, data is sent from the card is energized, it transmits its data to the reader, the reader then sends that information over to the panel over this unsecure channel. If somebody could get in the middle of that, which is what Jeremy just described, if somebody could get in the middle of that, they can see the read as it goes across, so they could take the, the card number, and then they can see the information as it's being sent back from the panel to the door for that unlocked state. So it can see, oh, at this card received access granted, and now all I have to do is replay that series of events through either my phone or a computer or whatever. And now I basically have unfettered access into your facility. Whereas with OSDP secure channel, the card is presented. There's a handshake that has to take place between the reader and the panel. And the data is being sent uh, over an encrypted, what, what did you say, uh, AES-128? That's right. Yep. So it, you'd have to, you know, do a whole heck of a lot more. And it's it's pretty much impossible it, today in 2020. I'm sure if we have this conversation five years from now, uh, it may certainly be possible to break 128-bit uh, encryption. But today, for the average hacker that's trying to gain access to, to your facility, it's highly unlikely that those series of events will happen to the point where they can break through not just the OSDP 
uh, handshake between reader and panel, but also the 128-bit encryption uh, on the line itself. So I think that's like super critical. People say, well, why do I have to adopt OSDP? If you're an end user and you've spent three to $5,000 per door uh, on an access control system, and you have 50 doors, 100 doors, 1,000 doors in your system, and you're relying on weakened technology to keep your system secure, you've got a big problem there. There's a big gap. And it's not super well known, I think, at the end user level. I mean, if we look at hacks that have occurred um, to large retailers, won't mention anybody by name, but a lot of those attacks, the vector that was used by the cyber, the cyber criminals was like, an HVAC system or some ancillary system. It's never like directly through your computer network in, in, in sort of a traditional sense. And the same thing is true with access control. Nobody's gonna, or I shouldn't say nobody, but it's improbable that a hacker is going to uh, you know, f get onto your network and get in through your access control software or, or server. I mean, it's certainly a potentiality. But what's far more likely to happen uh, is somebody's going to figure you've got Wigan protocol because everybody's had Wigan protocol forever, and they're going to break into your into your uh, facility using these very low tech devices. And uh, Jeremy, I mean, I'm I'm sure I could go on Amazon right now and buy one of these BLE keys or ESP keys for 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 peanuts, right? I mean, how much do one of these things cost? Yeah, so I've actually seen them on Amazon in like six and 12 packs. Uh, so it's like the Costco <laughs> version. Um, but a, a BLE key, I think, costs $35. And the ESP key, I think, is like 85 Yeah. So for for under 100 bucks, you know, you can you can pretty easily break into uh, into somebody's facility. It's uh, pretty scary, actually. All right. So a couple more questions on... OSDP then um, at the reader level. And I want to have a conversation about signal readers. So uh, HID has released an, a new line of readers that are OSDP uh, certified or, or how would how would you describe it, Tim? Like, are they OSDP based or like what's the marketing jargon? Sure, sure. So the, the most straight answer here is that the new signal line of readers have both a weakened output option as well as an OSDP output option. Um, as did the previous line of readers, the iClass SE series of, uh, of readers. What's different with Signo is it's not, a, it's not an add-on module for the OSDP and for the, the Bluetooth P's like it was with SE. It's built natively into the hardware of the reader, and then you have the option to select which output you, you prefer. Ah, there you go. Now, from a wiring perspective, because this is this is a question that I know we're going to get from the integration channel, is is the wiring different? Is it more onerous? Is it more difficult to install an OSDP reader as opposed to a, a standard Wigan protocol? I guess we'll go here, uh, Phil. I mean, one thing regarding the signal reader is one of the benefits it's using the same pinouts the same termination points so when you wire a reader say you start out weakened you wire the reader weakened wire to a mercury controller it's the same pinouts on both the panel side and the reader side so when you want to move to osdp you don't have to do any rewiring per se uh, jeremy may want to elaborate on some of the best practices probably will later but you can try using the existing wire, but we don't actually have to re-terminate the wire when you go from Wigan to OSDP. So it makes that process easier for a customer. So you don't, ha you don't have to change the pinout? Correct. So you, where you terminate wow. the wires on the radio, you do not have to change when you go from Wigan to OSDP. Wow, okay. So that that's like, you know, check a box right there. Oh, I'm going to have to rewire everything. So the answer to that question is no, you don't. Correct. Well, what else is different? We'll be shortly supporting uh, in a couple few months here what's called auto sensing. So I mentioned you don't have to change the termination points on the reader. Furthermore, um, if you want to switch from Wigan to OSDP, you can go into a PAX head end and simply sw uh, flip the switch from the head end to change from Wigan to OSDP, uh, and then it's done. Wow. Um, okay. 
any uh, distance limitations, wiring limitations? You know, is, is it like, oh, I could do a, a 5,000 feet before, but now I can only do 60 feet. Like, is there is there a difference from that perspective? Yeah, so from a wiring perspective, uh, we actually have improvements when using OSDP. So there's limitations on the Wigan side of wiring where you can go a max between reader and controller, and that's 500 feet. With OSDP, uh, it's a RS-45 protocol, and the RS-45 protocol has the specification of being 4,000 feet at the baud rates that our controllers and readers communicate. So we can actually go longer distances. Um, as we go longer distances, we should uh, start to implement some new things to really uh, utilize the, the proper wiring that's uh, recommended for RS-45 communication. Um, when you're going shorter distances, uh, let's say you're going 50 feet to 300 feet, Existing Wigand wiring uh, will just work perfectly fine with OSDP today. Uh, we've run a lot of tests on the HID side. We've had big spools of wire. We've attempted to inject lots of noise and lots of interference. And at those shorter distances, we could never degrade the signal of the OSDP message enough to make it so the controller and the reader can communicate. Once we start getting into those longer distances, that's where we can make an impact on the here here's like here's what i'm reading from this conversation osdp is way more secure it is encrypted from the the reader to the panel the communication is encrypted i don't have to change the wiring for shorter runs right if you want to run really really long uh maybe you you would think about a rewire but for the majority of systems out there you don't have to rewire. You don't have to re-terminate. And what, I mean, sounds to me like a no-lose situation. What's what's the catch? What's the caveat? There, there was one um, comment on my LinkedIn post that mentioned that uh, the readers tend to be more expensive. Is that the case? That's not the case with the signal reader, uh, as Tim was alluding to. We've actually built in that module. It's a it's a customer choice whether they enable or don't enable OSDP, but the cost is the same with the signal reader. Okay, so maybe in the past, uh, something that might have held somebody back is, oh, you know, the cost of the reader, or uh, Tim, as you were mentioning earlier, the I-Class SE readers, I got to buy another module if I want OSDP, but right. with the new Signo stuff, that's not the case. OSDP is just built in by default, and we don't have to worry about that. So we put in a signal reader, we don't have to change the wire, we get OSDP V2 secure channel, AES 128 bit encryption, and it's basically unhackable right now versus Wigand, which is completely wide open that I could break into anybody's facility for 35 bucks right now. Uh, any Anything that you wanna say at this point to really just stick the nail in the coffin for Wiegand. Uh, I, I wanted to add on to what Paul was saying in terms of uh, the perceived increased uh, increased cost of going to OSDP. One of the challenges we had going back a few years uh, at HID with the uh, I-Class SE series of readers, like we both mentioned already, the OSDP and Bluetooth module is an add-on piece. So to get optimal performance and have that OSDP output, you would have had to either pre-order the reader with that module added or add it on in the field. Well, we sold that reader for several years without the ability to add the module in the field because it's not just clipping on a module, it's uh, doing, it's updating the firmware as well. And we ran it on the reader manager application to be released and a few other things. So we've had that available now for a while with an HID. And that's going to remain available for your existing iClass SE readers. So if you have a reader installed today that does not have that module, you have the ability to add it in the field. And then like Paul was saying, um, it's built, like Paul and I are both saying, it's built in natively to the new Signo readers. So the perceived cost in the field, I, I don't think it was just the module. It's it's the cost of labor of going after each, each individual right. reader and adding that module. So it's gotten a lot um, simpler to do now. And, you know, it's 
relatively speaking, labor is going to be the higher cost there than yeah. the actual hardware. Right. I, I I think that bears you know talking about a little bit because I I can I can already see in the comments section um, on YouTube and LinkedIn yeah but you're not taking into account labor I get it I right. get it for sure but uh, something something that I would postulate to you if you went to an end user and said hey we installed this access control system you know X number of years ago there's been a new development in the world of security and securing these systems the the older protocol has some known vulnerabilities would you be interested in an upgrade to osdp for a price right we're not going to go in and offer to do this for free but if you went in and say hey mr end user we can really secure your facility by transferring to osdp it's not going to cost you that much because of all these labor savings i can reuse the wiring blah 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 maybe we're just changing out the readers which by the way this is a good time to talk about re-credentialing your facility getting you off of prox maybe going to a mobile credential or a more secure credential going to a better reader technology blah 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 so this is a great opportunity to go back to your end users that you've sold a Wigan system to and offer uh, uh, a large scale upgrade or a phased out upgrade. So yes, I understand from a labor perspective, there's more to it than just you know changing the reader, but I would postulate that there's a much better opportunity for, for upsell and for, uh, for adding value to your relationship with your end user. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I, 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 th I think you're spot on there. I think you're, in the right direction and the output and the relationship between the reader and the controller we as an industry we just really need to start thinking about that as part of the normal diagnostics that we do we look at when we look at a building we look at a system when we do a site survey right um, if you have a service contract that's a three to five year service contract keeping tabs on the protocol and the relationship between the readers and the controllers should just be part of it I, I think a lot of the time it already is for a lot of our system integration partners. It's just maybe not spelled out that way. Always. Yeah. So I, I definitely think that's that's where things are headed. Yep. If not there I, already. I couldn't I couldn't agree anymore. So I, I think we've sort of we've beaten this one to death. I think people by the end of this segment have a much better understanding of what OSDP is, what all the potential benefits are. I'm not even going to spend any time on why, you know, Weigand is insecure. I think we've kind of ostensibly done that by telling you everything that OSDP can do. Everything that we told you OSDP can do, Weigand cannot. Okay, so um, please, 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 no more Weigand protocol on any of your brand new access control uh, installations. Maybe a year from now, I'll uh, I'll do another poll to see if we moved from 63% are still installing Weigand to 63% are actually doing OSDP. It'd be even better if it was 100%, but we'll uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Um, one thing I, I'm not sure we really got to on the OSDP conversation, and perhaps this can be a good dovetail into the reader and credential conversation. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going. Is a lot of a lot of integrators I talk to, and a lot of end users make the assumption that they have to change the bit format or the credential technology in order to use OSDP. Like they say, oh well, I've I've only got a 35-bit Corp 1000 format. Mm -hmm. I have to have a different format now. The the data itself, the binary that's going from the reader to the controller and then onto the software is, I mean, the output from the reader is not really changing, right, Jeremy? I mean, it's still essentially the same type of data. What you see within Genetech is not really changing. It's um, exactly the same. Yeah, it's exactly the same. So, mm. you know, a, a, a point I like to make when I talk about like those BLE keys and everything, and I'm bringing this up not as part of the interview, but so we can discuss it as a group here. Sure. Is, you know, with those, um, the BLE keys and things where you can intercept the, the, the data, it's not just hearing one, repeating the one, and now I get access to the door. It, you could capture thousands of ID numbers, right? Mm -hmm. If you have an open 26-bit format, I can capture all those ID numbers. I can go down to ADI and buy a thousand duplicate cards for your building. The exact right. same thing. Right, 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 right. Right. So having a unique format and all that sort of thing becomes even more important, in my opinion. Yep, agreed. Yeah, yeah the, so whole, the whole format of credential technology. I hear customers say, "I want that twenty. I want that. I want that forty-eight bit credential uh, technology." 
Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> how many big. times have we gotten a, a, a call saying, hey, I, I need to order some more of those those weekend cards? That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going back a ways. <laughs> that is, yeah. <laughs> but what what everyone in in today's world thinks of is just because it's a weekend output, they think it's a weekend card. When right. that was a thing that we really haven't used since anyone on this call was, you know, well, out of my energy. my favorite one is I need some more of them HID cards. You got you need to give me more. Oh, <laughs> more. How, how about you can hit, have all of them? Hit, how about hit cards? Yeah, hit yeah. cards. Yep, hit. <laughs> oh anyway. boy, oh boy. All right, guys. So next segment, I want to use this time to talk about credentials because I think this is the other large misnomer uh, or, or or area that needs to be demystified in our space. I've been in the security industry for 20 years, 20 plus years, um, last four years at Genetech, and then before that, another manufacturing, before that, distribution. And I've sold HID credentials and HID product almost my entire adult career. And even still now, credentials get me a little get me a little nervous. When it's time for a credential order, I'm like, oh boy, here we go. An order form, how many bits, what format, what facility code, all that sort of stuff. So before we go there, because I want this to be more a, a conversation about best practice, let's just like we did in the prior segment for OSDP, let's finally bury procs, please. So I'll, I'll share a short story with you. Uh, I, I went to a school district not not too long ago. They had taken the painstaking. They have gone through the painstaking process of recredentialing or credentialing everybody in their school district. And we're talking about 2,000 students, you know, 500 staff. You know, maybe they had 3,000 cards that they had just credentialed out. I said, "Cool. What format did you go with?" And he said, "Oh yeah, those them Prox cards. Great. You like 125 kilohertz Prox cards? Yeah." Got a great price on them. I'm like, oh, you know, that's not really a super secure format. I could buy this thing on eBay to clone your cards and blah, blah, blah. And the the business administrator uh, kind of got up and walked out of the room, like disgusted. Like, I can't believe I just spent this much money and I'm going to have to go and and recredential. Like he kind of stuck his fingers in his ears, whoops, stuck his fingers in his ears and and walked out the door. So why is Prox? so bad it's a prox is inherently unsecure um so when you're presenting the card to the reader right talk about the front door and the back door is the front door of your home security there really are no checks and balances so there's an antenna and a chip on the card ultimately they get excited when is it when within that rf range of the reader and it doesn't discriminate whether it's a reader in the wall for true proper business intent and purposes of getting the building or if it's a device such as a prox cloner which are available very cheaply, just like the OSDP devices online, very cheaply available. And you can clone that card because it excites the chip and antenna of the card similar way and pulls the data off the card, reads the data, and then you can present that cloner to a second card and copy the data and you have an exact duplicate. I've actually seen uh, some stores that show like, oh, we, we copy regular, you know, brass keys, we copy car keys, and we copy... Uh, proximity cards and you know if you've got maybe somebody that's got like a gym membership and it's on a an unsecure prox card hey i want to duplicate that card so that way you know i don't lose my gym membership card or, or something like that but that same capability is possible for any organization that's using prox cards so if you could imagine worst case scenario you know I've, i'm an employee i'm in the parking lot i drop my card i leave and a bad actor who's just, you know, walking around the parking lot, picks up your card, clones it, duplicates it, and now has unfettered access to the facility uh, because the the system doesn't know that that's a different card. It just is assuming that it is the person that is assigned to that card. So really, really, really insecure. So best practice, I would think, would say no more procs. But then what do you replace procs with? Because, I mean, I've got a list of different card formats here. 13.56 megahertz, iClass, CIOS, mobile. What does, what's the best card format? What's the most secure card format that HID has today? Um, and what, what makes it so secure? Uh, so to get a little bit into reader and credential nomenclature world here, Bill, um, when those of us in the card and reader world at HID 
and beyond think about a format typically we the word format means to us how the credential or the card or the fob or whatever is programmed so the format mm. could be your you know your bit format that comprises a facility code and an id range okay so the credential technology i think is the important important discussion here right so there's a lot of different technologies that fall into that 125 k hertz uh, frequency that hid prox falls under and then a lot of credential technology that falls into the 1356 megahertz um, that that frequency which is also commonly referred to as contactless smart cards right mm. so hid has several offerings um, and we're also compatible with, uh, with with several different offerings, including so there's the iClass family, right? We're uh, now in the fourth generation, if you will, of iClass called CEOS, S-E-O-S. But then we also have the ability to write HID encryption to third party 1356 megahertz credentials, such as MyFair, Desfire, EV1, EV2, and so on. OK, um, one thing I kind of wanted to touch on as you're thinking about this, I keep using the word credential. Right. Um, you brought up early on. Well, you know, hey, I, I have these metal keys in my building. I want to move to a card. I want to do something. I'm going to have procs. Right. When you think about when HID first released the prox card, okay, which again, HID prox is our brand. There's lots of 125k hertz technologies that have come up over the years. Yep. But HID prox was the brand we released. What was it, guys? 1991, 1990? Early um, 90s. Yeah, it, it was it was right around the same time. Like Nirvana released Nevermind. We released Prox cards somewhere in the same vicinity. I think Pearl Jam released ten that same year. Um, the concept then was more: let's move away from metal keys. Let's get right. a let's get a contactless key. Right? Our world has changed. This isn't just a key. It's it's a credential that can be your identification for a lot of different things, right? And having that relationship be more secure and be encrypted is definitely the goal. Yeah, and I think that that's a great way to kind of tie in the the conversation that we just had about OSDP. OSDP, you know, versus Wiegand. Wiegand technology created in 1979, perfected in the 80s, and has been the de facto standard. And the security standards from 1980s technology is the same technology that is being used today in Wigan formats in credential technologies yeah you're right the the proximity card was designed to replace a brass key which was the least secure technology at the time prox sure. was more secure but times have changed that was 1991 i was still in junior high school at that point <laughs> um so now i'm uh, i'm almost 40 39 and uh that technology is no longer secure so why are we still securing our facilities when you know securing facilities with electronic access control and i just spent five thousand dollars per door securing my facility but i'm using the least secure uh credential technology so how do we migrate from prox to a more secure technology and what is that technology where should where should the industry be going so we can there's a couple ways you talked about migrating phil right there's a couple ways a customer can migrate from stocks and want to move to a newer technology uh there are a couple ways you can do that you need a bridge to get from point a to point b is how to describe it right point a being prox point b being a smart card uh credential uh, we sell uh, multi-class uh, readers. Uh, some of that nomenclature has changed with Signal. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit more later. But essentially, a reader that can read the low-frequency prox technology and newer, high-frequency, more secure credential technology, of which there's a couple options. So you can do the readers first and then later rebadge everyone. Mm. Alternatively, you can issue a multi-technology card where it has prox and a newer, high-frequency, more secure credential technology on it. And then later, uh, put in readers that can only read the more secure credential technology. Uh, Cause I was just going to say like, how would you prevent the, the procs from continuing to work? So you would just disable procs on the reader when you eventually migrated to new reader tech. So if you did the readers first and, and later rebadge, so in scenario one, yes, you would want to turn off uh, the ability to read prox technology, which can be done through our reader manager application. Um, in the second instance, you issue a multi uh, tech card and then later issue, you know, 
put in new readers only read the new technology. Uh, that seems more common uh, mm. in higher education uh, instances where they have a natural rebadge cycle. So sometimes okay. higher ed universities tend to do a, a rebadge of credentials first. So it really depends on a number of factors. Yeah, and I, and I think that's super important. So like in the example that I went into before, before the business administrator had ran out of the room uh, very upset with me for telling him that he, he'd made a bad purchasing decision, um, I would have told him, well, you don't have to re-credential everybody all at once. You, we can take this sort of slow roll approach. And as students are, you know, as your seniors graduate, the new freshman class comes in, they get the newer card formats. And within, you know, four years, you've transitioned everybody out of the uh, of the older technology. But he ran out of the room too fast for me. Well, you know, Phil, I think Jeremy, actually, if he wants to, I'll put him spot a little bit. He has a good example of a customer he worked with in the past where they kind of took a, a call a third scenario where they had a subset of customers that needed access server rooms. I don't, Jeremy, if you want to kind of elaborate. And I think that's a really good example that speaks to a, a creative third option for customers. Yeah, so before I came over to the controller side of the business, I dabbled a bit on the reader and credential side. So uh, when I was regional sales manager in the mid-Atlantic region, I had a customer that was, just, they had a huge campus. They had a few thousand readers. They had like 20,000 credentials and they were 100% procs. And they wanted to get off procs because of these security vulnerabilities and for the data that they were protecting. Um, but it was just unmanageable to try to rip the Band-Aid off all at once. So what they did is they said, what areas of our facility or our campus is most vulnerable and most important for us to secure? And what they identified was their server rooms, where they're storing uh, their client information. So what they did is they said, well, we have 17 readers getting into areas that store server equipment. And we have like 350 people that um, have access to those areas. So they rebadged those 350 people. They gave them a dual tech prox plus CIOS card. And then they replaced the 17 readers and they made those readers only read the high security technology 13.56 uh, CIOS credential. So they were able to secure the locations that were most important to them without having to rebadge 20,000 people and replace 3,000 readers. So I think uh, there's many different ways to skin the cat here. Uh, understanding what's most important is uh, is really beneficial. And then the HID team and the Genetech team can can help mold that and shape that approach. Absolutely. That That's actually, that's a great example. And I'm sure lots of people watching this are saying, you know what, I, I, I can think of, you know, that's my facility. I need to do that. Or as an integrator, you know, I've got tons of customers that fit into that exact mold. And, you know, I was considering, you know, how, how am I going to migrate them? And by the way, for the systems integration channel, again, just like upgrading from Wigan to OSDP, a re-credentialing is not something that should be verboten. Like you shouldn't talk about that. Oh my God, I'm I'm so afraid to talk about the fact that I sold them pro these proximity cards. No, the the t the technology has changed. It's time for an upgrade. You know, people upgrade their phones constantly. We're going to get into these in a second. People are upgrading their phones, their laptops. You know, everything's getting upgraded all the time. Why should their security be something that we're afraid to talk about upgrading? Um, so, you know what, that's actually a great segue into these devices. So HID is at the forefront of mobile credential technology, mobile uh credential formats. I'm a huge fan of mobile credentials. Um, sort of like, uh, as Tim was mentioning earlier, we went from brass keys to prox cards, and that was a, a huge leap forward. I think the prox card or the, the physical credential, you know, one of, one of these is almost an equivalent in my view to a brass key, not necessarily like if this is a CIOS card, which actually it is a CIOS card. Um, this being a CS card is obviously much more secure than uh, a standard prox, but I'm far more likely to lose. And this technology is not necessarily all that upgradable over the course of time, whereas this is a living, breathing thing, basically, and it has the capability 
to do secure payments, right? We're all basically paying for things, either it's Apple Pay or Google Play or Samsung Pay or you know whoever pay um, you're, you're using, but it's using NFC Bluetooth technology. And I think that there are some readers that you guys have that accept NFC Bluetooth and, and even Apple's new um, transmission protocol because we all know Apple needs to do things differently and special. Um, let's talk about that because again, I'm far more likely in an emergency to leave this on my desk and flee. I'm far less likely in an emergency to forget my phone. So mobile credentials, how do they work? And are they secure? Because I know that's the other concern from an end user perspective and from a systems integrator perspective is I'm afraid of this because this has perceived vulnerabilities. Is this more or less secure than this? I'll go again. Um, <laughs> so, so a couple things. Yeah, sorry. Uh, a couple things. Um, we didn't touch on our CS credential technology platform. Tim, maybe want to add to this as well. Um, our mobile, uh, we actually call mobile licenses, mobile like seat licenses that we use, are actually leveraging our CS credential technology in the back end, which has, there's a lot of underpinnings and details around CS, but has multiple layers of encryption. We digitally sign and bind data to the credential, in this case, a virt virtual credential. So it's using the CS credential technology as the underpinning. So we're using the latest and greatest, and CS is using all you know, standards-based uh, technology to encrypt and protect data, provide flexibility. That's what allows us to provide portability and put the credential on a phone. I would also reply to somebody who, who had that concern and say there's, there's more operational security when it comes to the mobile device. Uh, I'm less likely, and Phil, I think you alluded to, I'm less likely to leave my phone down or let me borrow my phone because I'm going to go up for a break, get some from the car, come back in the building. I'm going to hold that mobile device closer to me. And there's also things built in like biometrics or PIN, other second factors of authentication built into natively into a phone that we can leverage for better operational security. Yeah, I, I love that point, you know, uh, especially now post COVID world, people are, are considering different ways to gain access to facilities. And I've been getting a lot of questions about biometrics. Well, you know, with, with a biometric fingerprint reader, for example, uh, uh, it's a proven technology, it works, but you got to touch it. Nobody wants to touch anything anymore. Whereas this device, it's got facial recognition built into it or, you know, a fingerprint recognition or, or even just a basic pin. I think the majority of people are using some sort of password on their phone, right? Because we all, we keep so much private data on here. You'd be, you'd be crazy not to have a password on your phone. And how am I going to unlock it? I'm either going to put in a pin number or I'm gonna present my finger, or I'm gonna present my face. Then I would go into the HID app and present then my phone to the reader. Uh, I think there's even a way to do it sort of at a distance over Bluetooth. Can you talk a little bit about the two different ways, the two different methods like NFC versus Bluetooth? Sure, and you know when we talk about NFC versus, versus Bluetooth, to me that gets into some of the concerns a lot of folks would have around the security as well. Because what I hear a lot of the times um, from the channel and from the uh, the end users is the concern is more about the fact that we use Bluetooth to communicate between the phone or the mobile device, whatever it is, and and the reader. Um, it's not like pairing to a Bluetooth speaker, right? So like Paul was saying, you know, with the goal being to standardize on the CIOS credential platform, right? You're identification, what we, what we lock inside our secure identity object for the CIOS credential platform, whether that's living on a printable card or a CIOS key fob or on a mobile device, it's kind of, it's the same encrypted envelope of data, right? So we actually have that same level of encryption that goes, passes over the Bluetooth smart frequency that we do over the 13.56 megahertz frequency for a CIOS card. We're not, it's, it's not like when you pair to a Bluetooth speaker in your office or in your car um, where it's it's more or less open anybody can pair to it there's typically not even a password right maybe yeah, there's a, yeah, pin, yeah, a yeah. pin code on the screen of the car but that's that's a that's about it i mean how how many times have we all been sitting in our office on the phone with somebody and then all of a sudden you're talking to that person's wife because they pulled in the garage or whatever right. happens all the time right so that concern 
you know, like you were saying earlier, Phil, nothing is nothing is unhackable uh, for the future, but that's not a concern from a Bluetooth perspective here. Now, to get back to your original question about Bluetooth versus NFC, NFC or near field communication, it operates on the same frequency as that whole family of 13, 5, 6 megahertz or contactless smart cars that I mentioned earlier, right? So whether it's the first generation of iClass or CIOS, MyFair, Desfire, what have you, those are all 13.56 megahertz credentials, okay? So we've had NFC compatibility built natively into the iClass SE family of readers going back to 2014, okay? Mm. The user experience has improved over years. Um, and for several years um, before Apple released the iPhone with NFC built into it, you were only able to use Android devices for NFC communication with the reader. 13.56 megahertz as a protocol, right, for cards, whether it's on a phone or on a card, it's built for close range secure reads, right? So, and how many times we all gotten calls saying, you know, I, I want to, I want a long range CIOS reader, right? It's kind of hmm. like saying I want one of those diesel hybrids, right? It's it's not the same thing, right? So. Bluetooth is one of the ways that we can get some of the same level of encryption and security, but have a longer reach than NFC to do the same thing. Right? I see. That's, that's the idea. So anything 13.56 megahertz, depending on the reader platform, depending on how the reader is set up, um, you're, you're, you're looking in that two to three in, inch read range uh, for mobile access. It, it could be boosted. It can be increased by reader, but it's still meant to be close range. Right. And and just like a standard prox card, right? I mean, all most proximity readers have a two to four inch read range, but we all just put our card on the thing anyway. And I think the same thing would be true with uh, with one of with one of these. Uh, in fact, I, I do it all the time on my demo kit. Um, but the nice thing there is, unlike with uh, with card technology where I have to have I have a card. So this is a physical thing that I'm holding in my hand. And it was assigned to me, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it belongs to me necessarily. So if I found this in a parking lot and I wanted to walk into a facility, I could try it and, hey, the door might open. If I find a phone in a parking lot, the likelihood that the layperson is going to say, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to open that phone. I'm going to find the HID mobile app, and then I'm going to present it to a reader. A, that's that's far less likely to happen. But B, if that phone has a password on it, you can't even get to the, the mobile credentials. This, this, to me, is the most secure way. I think this is the best practice right now is either uh, CIOS cards, uh, contactless smart card technology, or mobile technology, which again is, is sort of predicated on, on, that same, on that same tech. The question then becomes price. So folks are afraid, oh my goodness, a prox card is only, only going to cost me a couple of dollars. How much is a CIOS card? How much is the mobile credential? So let's let's talk about like just a little bit without getting into the fine details. Like I don't, I'm not talking, I'm not here to talk about price. If you do, if you're watching this video and you want a price, uh, call me. Uh, all my contact <laughs> info is is down below, or contact your local regional sales manager for Genetech. Um, but what, what is the price difference? What's the disparity between the most secure tech and the least secure tech? We, what, what we can really speak to here, what, what this group is able to speak to is uh, HID pricing, right? Uh, of course. Um, there, there are lots of uh, HID comparable 125 kHz technologies, both on the reader and the credential side out there. Um, what, HID, what HID has done strategically right, is to keep the price the same or sometimes uh, gradually increase the price of antiquated technology, whatever that happens to be, whether that's in dollar cards and readers or traditional HID prox readers and cards. So depending on how the credentials built, how it's programmed, a simple printable prox card is actually going to be close to $2 higher in list price than a printable CIOS card, right? So our goal here uh, is to be the most cost effective for the most secure option possible, right? So when you, when it, some of the perceived increase in cost, I think, gets to when you start talking about migration strategy and you're talking about either dual technology readers or dual technology cards, 
whether you're talking to HID or some someone else within the channel, um, you have two technologies, the price is going to change, right? So that that's kind of the idea, and that's why it's important to really do um, a strict cost analysis long term in your ROI in terms of how you want to make that migration. Are we doing dual technology readers? We're we doing dual technology cards, and and so on, because that can impact the cost. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, one last point on price for mobile credentials. Is it sold the same way? Like, do I just buy a license or is it a subscription? Like, how does that work? So, you know, our current generation of mobile uh, credential technology and how we're going to market is what are called seat license model. So say you have a, a thousand uh, employees at your building and maybe at an average run rate, you might have, you know, 100 visitors. So you could buy 1,100, you could buy a little more to have a cushion, 1,100 seat licenses. So long as you're not using more than that number of mobile licenses concurrently, it's not an issue. And you can reuse those seat licenses at an unlimited number of times in subscription year. And then it's an annual subscription that's paid. So we adjust that model uh, over time based on customer feedback and, and talking to end users, consultants, integrators, OEMs as well. So. That's been adjusted to meet, I think, really what the market's demanding. We're consuming more things in everyday life. I am personally. I think we all are yep. on a subscription base. It makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the world is moving towards subscription. Genetech offers subscriptions to its software now. So even if you didn't want to host it in the cloud per se, um, you could still get an on-premises version of Genetech Security Center and pay for it with a subscription versus you know a big old capital expense. And I think that is just as relevant with credential technology. So uh, as an end user and as a systems integrator, I have to buy all these cards. I have to stick them on a shelf. I need some extra cards for, for re-credentialing folks or adding new folks to, uh, to the facility. You know, ordering those, those cards requires, you know, a, a pretty sizable upfront cost versus, you know, the, a subscription model can scale with the organization and with, for our systems integration channel and our partners, it's a, it's a recurring revenue model for them. And for our end user partners, this is a way to get that capital expense uh, concern out of, out of here, right? I have these 125 kilohertz prox cards. I got to get rid of them. I don't have the capital budget, uh, especially now for, um, for a large scale rebadging of my entire organization, but I can move to mobile being one of the most secure formats and not have it impact my capital budget. I can move it to operating. So I think that's a, that's a really smart play, uh, both on the, on HID side. And if an end user were to, were to go with that particular model. So, um, any parting words on credential technology gents? I, I do have one thing I want to add, and that is we, we spend a lot of time, as, as we should, regarding credential technology and the vulnerabilities and risks that provides to an organization, right? If somebody gets in the building as Phil, and that's Jeremy, it's Tim or myself, and that's not what you want when you're talking access control, the amount of money you're investing. But one of the pushbacks we hear, sometimes from smaller customers, medium-sized customers, is, well, that won't happen to me, or that's not <laughs> the case for me. Right. And that sometimes comes with more education and showing them that gets them over that hurdle. I think there's a second aspect, and that is actual cost. Certainly, there's a cost of security breach, but I say more of a obvious monetary cost to the organization where we've seen gym memberships, uh, parking uh, applications where somebody's provided a prox credential with the assumption payment has been rendered to have that benefit. And we've had a lot of customer discussions amongst a few of us here from HD Mercury, uh, whereby that was taken advantage of. So they either sold and were an entrepreneur or they actually gave it to Buddy and had three or four people parking for the same price as one. So that entity is uh. a loose. So I think security, certainly. But on the other hand, you also have the potential real, very real financial loss if there's paid for services. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the pay for services and and you mentioned it as well, the the risk of to the organization if something really bad were to happen. What is that financial impact? I know from a cybersecurity perspective, a hack of a even a medium sized company can have 
major financial ramifications for years and years and years. If you're looking at governments, you know, where we, we kind of see it happen. About, thankfully, it's happening less and less. But, you know, large cities being held for ransom because somebody forgot to change the default username and password on something. You know, it's it's not impossible for your credential tech to be used to for somebody to do something bad in your facility. So, um, yeah, great, great point, Paul. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you hammered that one home. Yeah, Phil, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and talking about re returning to work, right, in, in a lot of places. Um, you know, our normal office lives are, are probably not going to be what they once were, at least not for a long time. But there's a lot of need, especially within the manufacturing world, uh, to, to get back to work or stay at work, maybe increase shifts, add shifts, all that sort of thing. With that in mind, your audit trail within your access control system is going to be as critical, if not more critical than ever, I, I think, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, being yeah. able to accurately control um, who is going where, when, and get, get a, a good audit trail that you can cross-reference with video and what have you, right? So if Paul is able to go to the grocery store and make a copy of his card, uh, you know, keep one at his desk, keep one in his bag, keep one in his car, wh whatever. Um, even if his intent is not malicious, right? Your visibility into how your system is actually being operated uh, is is compromised, right? That, that was probably not Paul's intent there, but that that could happen, right? For sure. Yeah, I, I, and, I think that's a fantastic point. That's something that I even I hadn't thought of. Uh, right. So I know for our own organization, we're considering like a, a um, bringing folks back, but in a staggered way, you know, a few days right. on, a few days off, you know, in the office, out of the office. But if you're right, if you had a, not necessarily somebody being a bad actor, but right. somebody trying to help somebody out. Right. Hey, I'll, I'll make a couple of copies. That way you can you can get in even if I'm not there. Um, completely subverts your your policy as it pertains to return to work. I I think that's a great point. You know, at uh, in Montreal, right it, at at the Genentech HQ, you guys have your amazing clear ID system for check in, where I you know scan scan my passport, takes a picture of me, I'm all checked in, pre registered, and everything. And thankfully, when you guys hand me my visitor card, uh, it's a CS card, so it's encrypted. Yeah, but there's probably a lot of organizations out there that visitor management software um, and having that tied into access control is something a lot of folks I think are, maybe they were already looking at it um, before the pandemic, but it's certainly on their minds now, being able to pre-register visitors to come in uh, or even visitors from other offices within the same organization, right? Yep. So if I'm going from my company site in Dallas to my company site in Chicago and I get a visitor card for the Chicago office, if I go to that site and I'm handed a prox card after all the secure visitor check-in, then it can undermine the investment that I've 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 already made there, right? So, un unfortunately, there, there's kind of endless conversation that we can have about risks of any vulnerable 125 kHz proximity technology, whether it's HID or not. Um, same 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 with with Wigan. So, I certainly don't want to beat that one to death there but yeah. it's no, uh, it's it's a great point and actually i just uh i just recorded i'll be posting the video here shortly uh if if it's up when uh when this video is up i'll throw a card up here for it but visitor management tying into an access control system again you know kind of like what we talked about earlier you spent three to five thousand dollars per door putting electronic security everywhere hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for your organization and i come to your facility to check in as a visitor and i'm writing my name on a piece of paper it's like what it, it, I, I don't understand this. And to your point, well, now I'm OK. They wrote down their name on the pen and paper, and now I'm just going to give them carte blanche into my facility. These are the people that we need to be watching the most. Uh, and yet we're just sort of w allowing them to walk through or in a better case scenario, they're checked in through a visitor management system, but they're still provisioned a, an insecure credential. Did you get that credential back? Well, if not, what's the likelihood that they went out and duplicated that credential? It, it's a non-zero chance, right? And if we're trying to protect our facilities and our, and, and our intellectual property from being breached, well, you 
basically just gave the keys to the kingdom to somebody that you haven't necessarily vetted all that well. So step one, put in an access control system. Step two, tie your visitor management with with your access control system. Genetech does that really well, and I appreciate the uh, the plug there for Clear ID too, so we could pre-register the guests <laughs> and everything. That's great. Um, HID also has Easy Lobby. I've I've heard mixed things about that. Just kidding, guys. Just kidding. Uh, we actually have a fantastic HID Easy Lobby integration. So if you do have Easy Lobby, we can integrate that into Security Center to to merge the two together. And then finally, provisioning them a card and making sure that that card is a secure format, CIOS, contactless smart card. So uh, thanks for that, Tim. Uh, I, th yeah. I think that, that was fantastic. You know, so I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Phil. Um, I was going to say with mobile access as well, you know, while I fully believe that most environment, most uh, our partners are going to be using um, mobile access as a supplementary tool to physical IDs, not necessarily always as a complete replacement, when you think about that visitor coming to your building, being able to issue them their ID, their visitor badge, if you will, via email without them having to come in contact with anyone at a, at a reception desk, right? That's a, that's a, a potential advantage of, of mobile. And it's also part of the reason that we moved things, like Paul was saying earlier, if we moved things from the old perpetual model where we sold them just like physical cards to the subscription base and those licenses, right? Because you can you can reuse that license that seat as many times as you need to throughout oh, throughout go. the year, right? Yep. So you're not necessarily having to make an increase to your budget to buy a separate box, if you will, of visitor cards, right? It, it can be part of your normal m mobile access uh, cloud-based portal of IDs. So just food for thought there. That's great. All right, guys, so that was a great, robust conversation about credential technology. I, I actually learned some stuff there myself. Um, readers now, so reader technology. We hear like multi-tech readers, uh, Bluetooth, NFC, we kind of talked about um, in, in the last conversation uh, about credentials. Let's, let's loop back to our earlier conversation about OSDP. Because the reader is 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 a critical component in that um, in that chain of technology, right? Credential gets presented to the reader. The reader communicates to the panel. That reader must also be OSDP compliant. Is that right, Jeremy? Yeah, that's right. So there's there's always three things that are needed. You need a reader that supports OSDP. You need a controller that supports OSDP and you need an access control software that supports it. So all three are a requirement uh, to have a chain without a, a broken link. And uh, obviously Genetech Synergist supports OSDP. Um, so no need to worry about that. There are no other access control systems out there, only Genetech Synergist. Okay. I'm doing my Jedi mind trick on, on everybody, right? Go out and buy Synergist, please. Uh, so um, other technologies, so Again, I want to upgrade to OSDP, uh, secure channel for cybersecurity concerns and, you know, for data security, data privacy, all that sort of fun stuff. I want to move to a more secure credential format, so I'm going to move to CIOS, or I may even move to, uh, to mobile credentials. What does HID offer in the way of readers that's going to support that migration? You know, so I think it'd be a good time to talk about the Signal platform, Phil. Yeah. Um, and, and there are a lot of similarities between our SC Series E uh, readers and Signal, but we made some additional enhancements. So the bottom line is really we do position as a quote unquote Swiss Army knife of readers, right? It's 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 supported all the previous technologies the SC Series E line did with also additional uh, capabilities and standards built into it. So. You, it supports every from, everything from HID Prox and Dollar Prox, so the same reader as HID Prox, all the way up to iClass, iClass SE, MyFair, DustFire, uh, EV1, EV2, all the way up to SIA. So what I think there's a there's a really strong value proposition in the signal reader in that you can, in theory, buy a signal reader today. Of course, we like to sell uh, CS credential technology, but say they want to use uh, DustFire. They don't necessarily have to make all those choices up front. 
Mm. There are a lot of underpinnings that would that warrant a, a further deep dive conversation. Certainly, we're probably getting to here today. But that reader, they can invest in with confidence, knowing that whatever the myriad of credentials they have, the mix and match are, that reader is going to support them for their journey moving from old to new. Yeah, uh, agreed. So just because you're you can't go through a whole recredentialing of your entire uh, organization doesn't necessarily mean that you can't uh, upgrade the the reader formats, the reader technologies as a way to start that process. And that's probably, you know, we, we talked about a couple of examples earlier, but that's one of the examples. That's one of the migration plans is keep your older card tech, upgrade your readers. Now you have OSDP going from your reader to your panel. And then as the budget allows, we can start to provision uh, more secure card formats and turn off the 125 kilohertz procs on the on the signal reader. Um, what is so I was looking at the spec sheet for Signo, and there's a few things on there that um, that I had was scratching my head. There's some term called Origo or Origo. What is that? Uh, so the HID Origo brand is uh, it's it's our brand for our cloud services platform. Okay, so anything that HID is now offering and will be offering move, moving forward that utilizes um, a, our global cloud platform is going to fall under that Arigo umbrella. Okay, so mm. mobile access, for, for example, um, instead of instead of just just calling it, you know, the subscription version of HID mobile access, it's actually built on the Arigo platform. Okay, gotcha. so when okay. Gen, when Genetech uh, worked on writing their integration to the access control the mobile access portal um, with HID they had to write an, a new integration um, to the Rigo portal right so it's the Rigo based portal same thing if you're using like our location services platform or if you're using the reader manager application it's all technically utilizing the Rigo cloud so gotcha. long term uh, for our reader and controller business uh, we won't get too deep into this here um, just for the sake of time, but the idea is to be able to have the ability to see, run diagnostics, and update readers from a central software point utilizing cloud data, right? So mm. that's kind of long-term stuff. That's why it's that's why it's mentioned in some of the data sheets on Signal. Gotcha. I don't, Paul, Jeremy, if you guys had anything to add on that. Correct. I mean, I agree. I mean, so right now, Regal Platform, that's how that's what's serving up and that's how we're issuing mobile licenses. In the future, as Tim mentioned, we'll be adding other services and solutions uh, that are also talking to that, that same common cloud platform. What, but now, today, how would one go about upgrading firmware and what's, what's HID's stance on how often firmware should be upgraded on a reader basis? There's 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 a lot of good questions bundled up in there, Phil, and a lot of good yeah. Sorry, topics. I, I, I tend <laughs> to throw out 15 questions. Feel free to answer whichever <laughs> one you want. <laughs> so, in in terms of in terms of what we're doing today, <clears throat> for both the iClass SE platform as well as for the Signal line, um, we're the, the goal first and foremost is to move away from having to rely too heavily on physical configuration cards, right? Because depending on the update that you have to do to the reader, uh, certain firmware updates could even require multiple configuration cards, and the step-by-step -step process has to be done surgically to to eliminate risk of damaging the reader. And in some cases, right? So, using the Reader Manager app on an Android or an Apple mobile device phone um, is it, it simplifies that process quite a bit. Allows you to still do it with the push of the button. But it's still reader by reader, as you have to essentially, with permission of the system owner, pair to each individual reader to run your diagnostics and update the reader as as needed. In terms of how frequently you're having to run or complete firmware updates on the reader, welcome Paul and Jeremy to weigh in here. But typically, uh, a firmware update on the reader is not mandatory unless you're making some sort of change to the reader's configuration and performance, right? If you're actually impacting or, or shifting what the firmware is doing somehow, adding an elite key to the reader, turning on OSDP when it's previously been weakened, something of that nature, 
Um, but it's not it's not like your phone where you know your your the stuff you're like with my with your phone if you don't do your Apple OS update the stuff you're already using day to day is not going to work as well if you don't do that software update not the same thing with the reader update i see okay fair enough do you have anything out of that guys i mean you're more engineering minded than me paul jerry yeah so so i don't think we can do some of this stuff today so i'm not sure how much we should dive into this but i think the end goal is to use things like osdp and be able to push updates over the wire um there's always some technical challenges when when we start doing uh, new things like that. But I think that's that's long-term goal. That's uh, you know where we, we see our vision going. Uh, I see. As for how often firmware updates should be done, I've been doing this for, for 12, 13 years now. And you know, I'm not hearing many people update firmware on, on readers very often. Uh, what I am seeing, and uh, I, I see that same uh, idea shift into the controller space. And I feel like controllers are more so a computer where they're running uh, really complex software with with our partners. And uh, we should be keeping those updates uh, more up to date than we have in the past. So I've heard integrators say things like, I just don't trust it. What happens if it breaks? Um, it's a pain in the butt to do. Maybe my doors go down for a couple of seconds. Um, I think we're at a point in the world today where when we focus on cybersecurity, if I came to any network or IT person and I said, you know what, it's a pain to update the firmware on your switch, <laughs> they would laugh at me and kick me out of the room and tell me I'm updating the firmware on my switch every single month on a, a plan. And I think we start, we need to start looking at ourselves in the access control space as really being another uh, branch or component of a, an IT system. And I think we need to start focusing on uh, creating plans and timelines on when firmware should be updated. So uh, the relationship that we have on the controller side with Genetech, you help greatly with pushing that uh, through your solution uh, when there are new firmware updates. But I think it's important for uh, system integrators and end users that are on the line that uh, we should really start looking at ways to um, streamline that and make that more of a commonality than it's been in the past. Wow. I, you know, I don't understand why our industry sometimes is so far behind on stuff like this, because you're, you're a hundred percent right. And I never thought about it in the way that you, that you, that you said it, right. If you went to an IT manager and said, I'm not going to upgrade your firmware, I'm not going to do windows updates, or I'm not going to, you know, do whatever on your network, they would throw you the hell out of there. Whereas for us, it's like, yep, here's this 125 kilohertz insecure, uh, credential technology. Here's this Wigan format that's wide open. And, you know, I, I haven't upgraded the firmware on your access control panels in, uh, in an age where, where else does that happen in, in our business? It, 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 like, it doesn't make sense in the technology world. I mean, shoot, if you if you have a Tesla, you can't wait for the firmware upgrade to come out. If you've got a an iPhone or an Android device, you you can't wait for the next version of the OS to come out. When Windows issues a, a, a release, you're updating Windows because you know that it's an in, you know it, once the vulnerability has been discovered, the manufacturers are very fast to get these these things fixed. I mean, even from a Genetech perspective, if there's a vulnerability, we throw that out there. We let everybody know there's a vulnerability. And oh, by the way, here's the fix for it. So of course you would fix it. So why not? Why isn't upgrading the firmware on the panels, you know, going with more secure technology? Why is that like pulling teeth? And I, I really just think it's an education thing. So I'm, I'm super grateful that you guys are are doing this with me today because I I just think that they're it just doesn't get thought about. So Jeremy, uh, it's a fantastic point and actually a really good segue to move from readers uh, to panels. Before I do that, uh, gents, any final words on on Signo? If you if you have more questions about Signo, you know I'll, I'll put uh, the link to the uh, to the product page down below. Uh, but any any parting words on the Signo line? 
I, no, I just wanted to pile on quickly to something that, that Jeremy said, if I could. Um, it was a real good, good distinction that he made between panel updates in terms of firmware and reader updates, and they really shouldn't be looked at the same way. When we think about improving you know, how we make updates to the readers with, with Reader Manager and down the road doing it through the software via OSDP, I personally don't think that just making updates to the reader should be seen as the main advantage. Mm. Um, being able to run diagnostics on the reader and see what you have is almost more important, right? Uh, I mean, it, th those of us that have lived and breathed the reader and credential world for most of our, our careers, um, you know, I don't know how many times we've gotten a call saying, you know, hey, my, my reader isn't reading my card exactly right or it's not performing the way I expect it to or whatever. And the, the best way to figure out what you have is to pull it off the wall, read the serial number off the back, call tech support. They look yeah, at and then ugly. we can only tell you at that point how we shipped it, not what has been done to it over time. Right. So whether it's reader manager or communication via OSDP, being able to actually see what frequencies are off and on. You know, I, I know I maybe you have a mixture of weakened and OSDP in your reader population. You want to be able to know that and know which which door is which. So I, I just want to make sure we're clear that uh, we are <laughs> we are not recommending that people go around updating reader firmware all the time. Uh, right. That's that, that's not the recommendation. Knowing what you've got. And knowing how that reader is set up is really the more uh, important piece there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you you mentioned this, but one of the advantages with OSDP that we haven't really talked about is, you know, the ability to pull that data off of the reader and, and be able to have two-way communication between the reader and the panel and, and right. ostensibly the software as well. You know, Phil, I was going to have one more thing. You know, we kind of this is a summary point when we look at credential and reader and really panel technologies, we segue to the next section. You know, I have this, you know, I have conversations called like a best practice pyramid. I think we all on this call have had that discussion with customers. You know, we can look at the very obvious thing or hopefully more obvious thing now, credential technology being the baseline of that pyramid, right? That security posture, yep. right? But there are a lot of layers on top of that. And, and this is a very guided and consultative discussion with customers whereby you can bring a, you know, jet attack or an HID in, into those conversations. But there's a lot, we won't have time to get all the nuances in, in today's call, but there are other best practices on top of the credential technology. You know, we have things like, you know, standard keys and things called elite keys. So when we talk about that handshake that occurs between a credential and the reader, establish trust. They're using CIOS, there's multiple layers of encryption. There's a lot we do to protect that transaction. But there are additional best practices on top of that that really should be considered when you look at the full picture. You know, I'll use elite key as an example. You can put another layer on that reader where you have a key, we call it elite or an ice key. That elite or ice key has to reside on the reader and on the credential, or in the case of what we call a mob key. And, and as a prerequisite to having the conversation we talked about, CS and other smart card technology, we have that additional layer to ensure, you know, that, you know, I'll use the Coca-Cola and Pepsi as an example. Coca-Cola has an elite key, Pepsi has an elite key. I can't, if I have all the other information correct, I can't use my Coca-Cola credential on a Pepsi reader and vice versa because they've each been set up with a customer unique elite key. There's things like using track and managed formats, things like OSDP. So I think if we, if we step back and kind of review the conversation we had, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. And it's important having the conversation, you know, and reviewing security posture going forward to really look at all pieces of that puzzle. I and mean, that's where we can help. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're considering a move off of older technology onto something, you know, new like a CIOS or, or an iClass or, you know, you want to move to a signal reader, an OSDP, these are conversations that you should definitely have with the gentleman on this call from HID or your access control provider, in this case would be Genetech, or with your systems integration partner, or maybe everybody all sitting at the same table and, and discussing you know, all the, uh, the pros and cons, the pitfalls, the potential concerns, and of course the best practices for your specific organization. You know, the, the challenge sometimes is, especially when we have these best practices conversations, there are broad general best practices that we should all abide by, right? So, you know, moving to secure formats, better, you know, uh, better technologies like OSDP, blah, blah, blah. 
but what's best practice for your organization is going to be different than what industry best practice necessarily is. So, you know, you, you always have to take that into account too, which is why, you know, while you can use this as an informational video about what you should be doing in general, you should be having these policy and procedure discussions internally and with your, with your trusted advisors, either at Genetech, HID, or your systems integrator. So I do think though, um, Paul, that's a good segue into the last piece of this, right? So we've gone from the credential to the reader to the wire between the reader and the panel and having that communication be uh, via OSDP. So now we get to the panel. And Jeremy, you sort of mentioned panel technology earlier um, and some of you know the things that we need to be concerned about from an upgrading of firmware perspective and whatnot. But uh, so HID was well known for for a good long time and still is for their vertex line of intelligent controllers uh also edge edge evo uh sort of like the um the uh, poe style you know reader at the door or panel at the door kind of kind of thing uh but then they also acquired mercury security which is you know was or still is the um, the non-proprietary access control panel of choice for the the industry at large so obviously genetech is a huge partner of mercury security and of course is a huge oem partner with with hid um mercury also is capable and all, vertex as well is capable of being used on other access control platforms not that i know of any ones other than genetech uh but uh open platform and this is one of the things that we talk to with our end user partners and with our systems integration partners when it comes time to choose an access control system whether that's genetech or something else what you really should be looking at from a best practice conversation is non-proprietary intelligent controller hardware the worst thing in the world you can do my opinion and i'm probably the opinions of the guys on the on on the chat as well is choosing a manufacturer that is proprietary to their software in other words i've picked this brand this brand's panel will only work with that brand's software so now if I no longer like that brand software or that software brand goes out of business or whatever, maybe they don't support OSDP in, in their stuff and I need to move to a more secure format, what I'm staring down the barrel of is a complete rip and replace of all the panel technology. You know, maybe the readers can stay, maybe the wiring can stay, maybe the, the, the door stuff can stay, but the panel itself, which is one of the most expensive pieces, needs to be completely ripped out and rewired. This is no fun. This is thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in material and labor. Whereas a Vertex board is uh, capable of being used by multiple manufacturers. An HI, uh, excuse me, a Mercury board, you know, call it an LP 1501, 1502. Some, some other brands call it a, a different part number, but ostensibly it's the same. And maybe we should talk about that. Um, you buy Genetech today, if five years from now you, you don't like Genetech anymore for whatever reason, you can migrate that panel over to a different piece of software. So let's, let's actually start the conversation there. What is the difference from a Mercury perspective, uh, Genetech versus other brands? Is it a different panel? Is it a different firmware? What is different from brand to brand without talking about the the other brands in, in any sort of specificity, right? So if competitors, if you want to do your own video, you're, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, so th we'll keep this as Genetech specific as possible. But um, what's the difference between a Genetech branded Mercury controller and something else? Yeah, I mean, the message of being open is is really that. So all of our partners that we have today, they get truly exactly the same thing from HID. The Mercury controllers are, uh, the hardware is exactly the same. All of our partners get the same firmware. So we're not cutting special versions of firmware for one partner and a different version of firmware for another partner. Um, and all the tools and support and everything that our partners get is the same as well. So there's, there's one small variation that, that we do. We load what we call an OEM code on all of our controllers. So when we ship a controller to Genetech, it has Genetech's OEM code that will display Genetech's logo on the web page and any default configurations that you want on that web page. 
And if we were to ship to another partner, it would have their OEM code with their logo. And, um, but that's really the only difference. So from our perspective, there's really no difference. Um, some partners take that OEM code and they uh, will limit controllers coming onto their system and they will only allow that if it's their OEM code. Now we give the ability for our partners to change the OEM code to their own, uh, so it's not a, a critical deal. Um, but the, the message is there's 4 million plus controllers out there in the world today. If it's Mercury, our Mercury partners have the ability to talk to any of them. Yeah, uh, that's that's really the the biggest advantage when going Mercury, and I think HID probably recognized that and said we need to partner with these guys, so let's let's bring them under the the uh, the HID umbrella. What's so it's interesting as a regional sales manager. Obviously, I have a a bunch of different partners, and if you polled my customers, I'd say it would probably be a 60-40 split between Mercury panel integration and vertex like v1000s v100s v200s uh probably 60 percent would be doing mercury maybe a little bit higher 65 percent whereas the the balance would do vertex and i've always tried to get to the understanding of like why you would choose one over the other what what are some of the advantages of uh mercury versus vertex because like i said the majority of folks are, are using mercury panels but a, a good healthy chunk are also using vertex yeah, so I think if we step back into history um, a bit before the HID acquisition of Mercury, HID had their controller brand, which was Vertex. Mercury had their controller brand, and we kind of went head to head uh, and competed against each other. So now that uh, HID has acquired Mercury and we're one big family now, it's really two offerings. Um, Mercury has uh, recently released the LP and Series 3 controller line, and that enabled us to do things like OSDP on every reader port and some of the more uh, updated cyber things that are required. Vertex, uh, I would equate that more to the, the legacy version of the, the Mercury controller, so similar to the EP in Series 2. I see. Uh, so, we lose some functionality on things like OSDP where that's not supported today on, on the Vertex side. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Um, what are some of the, uh, the benefits of going, or actually, let me rephrase. So Mercury recently, and you kind of just alluded to this, went from EP panel to LP panel. What's the difference other than the color? So one is green, one is red, that I know. Why Why the change? Yeah, so the, the update from EP and LP and Series 2 to Series 3 for the downstream boards, it was focused on really two areas. So we improved some of the components on the board. We put in uh, stronger and faster processing uh, power processors. We put um, updated relays, and there were some shortages on components that were used on some of the legacy hardware. But then the real focus was really around cybersecurity. So um, we added crypto modules. So the data that we're storing on the panel is secured and it's locked and people can't get access to it. Uh, we support OSDP on every single reader panel. We enabled the ability to talk uh, TLS 1.2. So that's really a handshake from the controller to uh, through the network and out to the access control uh, system. And um, we also automatically enabled AES-256 encryption between the LP controller and the, the Series 3 SIO. So what we were finding back in the Series 2 and EP days, we had some of these abilities, but it required people in the field to understand what that was. And that some of this stuff takes some, some really high-level IT experience. Um, and they had to enable that in the field. And what we found is that wasn't being done. So yep. we took a, a different approach and we said, we're not giving you security by choice anymore. You get security by default. Right. I love that. Um, so one of the, the questions that I have, and this is more like an existential question, if the industry as a whole recognizes that OSDP is the best thing to go with, um, but 
you still have people because of a wide variety of reasons still choosing Weekend. Why not make it? Why not make that the default? Like we're no longer supporting Weekend, and I get why why you can't do that because there's so much legacy stuff out there. But I think there isn't there one panel that you offer that is OSDP only. Yeah, we have the MR sixty two E. Uh, so that's a that was a new panel that we released, and it does not have any Wigan support on it whatsoever. So it's a two reader, two door, uh, edge based controller that's PoE plus, and it's OSDP only. So off of that, um, there's a I'm sure we can get into this as well, but there's a concept of multi drop uh, where you can piggyback or daisy chain your readers together, and you could use uh, two readers per door and use that for an in-out or an anti-passback type function functionality. So on a MR62E, OSDP only, you can support two doors, and you could have technically four readers if using that daisy chaining multi-drop functionality. And is that because of OSDP, because of like the RS45 between, between all the readers? Yeah, exactly. So um, it's just a, a benefit that we receive because OSDP is a 45 communication protocol. Yet another reason to go OSDP as opposed to Weekend. But as a as an integration organization, um, maybe the MR62 is your standard. And when you go and you pitch um, a new access control system to a potential end user, you can say that we go OSDP and we only use the MR62Es at the edge because they're OSDP only. You will never find Weekend here because we just at the devices no longer support it. And as an end user, and maybe as a consultant, um, you may say, you know what, the only devices that we're going to allow on our network are OSDP only, or potentially, you know, so aside from your intelligent controller, your LP1501, 1502, your downstream devices are all MR, MR62Es. So it makes, uh, it makes the job easier from the consultant and the end user level to say, you know what, we're going to be OSDP only, and we're going to force people into it by only allowing this particular product. Um, just to close the loop on Vertex, Vertex does not does or does not currently support OSDP. It does not. Okay. There is a workaround around that, though. I'll, I'll talk about uh, it from a Genetech perspective. I don't know if this is true from other brands, but with the Genetech uh, Synergist Cloud Link, you can wire. So the Synergist Cloud Link accepts RS forty five communications. You can use the Cloud Link as an intelligent controller wiring your Signo readers, your OSDP readers, directly into the cloud link, and then using V100 and V200 uh, panels for your uh, for your data communication to the, for like the IOs, right? So uh, when we get a good read, we can trigger the V100 to open the door, right? But at least the communication from the reader to the uh, to the panel is now OSDP, and then the only thing coming back to the door is the open or close, uh, which is really just an, an electrical circuit. So there there is a workaround there to go if you do have legacy Vertex hardware and you want to move to an OSDP environment. We can do that with the Synergist Cloud Link with Genetech. Of course, contact your Genetech regional sales manager for more information and probably the sales engineer because I just learned this the other day and uh, uh, was a little bit over my head. So, um, guys, I, th I think that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to talk about, right? So we, we talked about from the, from the credential to the reader, across the wire, into the panel, um, we can have probably a different conversation. Maybe that's a conversation for another day or another video about, you know, the benefits of using Synergis and which is Genetech's access control prod product. Uh, but, um, you know, just a couple of parting words, anything that we missed uh, and anything that you'd like the industry to know more about HID and Mercury. Paul, why don't uh, why don't we start with you? I think I'll go back to my statement earlier. There, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces, right? And when you kind of think about our conversation you've had over the course of this, this series here, um, to me, it's all about end-to-end -end security from the edge, you know, meaning the card, to the reader, to the panel, uh, controller, right, all the way to the PAX head end. It's important to have that conversation with all the parts and pieces um, and certainly anyone who's, who's listening who's an integrator, I think there's tremendous opportunity for integrators to, to leverage these to really build that trusted advisor role 
than customers or same for consultants. And we're here to help, we're here to assist and guide that discussion. We're talking generalities, right? But there are a lot of nuances. There are customers that have mergers and acquisitions, a lot of use cases that aren't necessarily cookie cutters. Certainly a lot of them are, but certainly reach out. We're, we're happy to assist, um, whether it's talk about the new signal line. You know, we've done a lot, I think, over the past 12, 24 months, whether it's a tool like Reader Manager, whether it's a reader that's really pushing the envelope and getting customers to adopt new technology. There's a lot that's gone on in the past 12, 24 months, and there's a lot we're doing. We look at the future um, and future enabler customers. I've hesitated to use the word future proof, but it was all about future enabled customers, giving them a platform they can use and invest in with confidence to meet their current needs, but maybe needs they don't even know they're going to have in the future. So I think that's a very important conversation and really tying in all those parts and pieces. Well said. Tim, what would you what would you like to add there? Uh, that, that was really well said by Paul. I uh, just want to say, say thanks for the opportunity to come on and have have the discussion. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, for watching. It's it's good it's it's good good discussion, especially during these um, unprecedented times. It's 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 really it's really fun to sit down with with colleagues from the industry. Um, and it's it's really evidence to me that not just Genetech and HID, but our, our industry, our partners, our end users, everyone, um, we were already evolving from a commodity-based business to something that's very tech and solution-oriented moving forward. Um, I think a lot of organizations, HID included, have been trying to do that, trying to push that forward for a while. And <laughs> during these days, um, it's, it, it's happening. It's happening organically, so it's great to see the efforts that all of our partners have been putting in uh, kind of come to fruition here. So thanks again, Phil. Appreciate yep, it. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Tim. And Jeremy? Yeah, so I'll just add just a couple of additional things that I think might be important. So I know we've hit on OSDP a lot. Um, the inventor of the Wiegand technology, John Wiegand, he died in 1986. Mm. I believe that he patented the communication and i guess don't quote me on this but i believe the year was 1986 that the patent actually went through for Wigan communication so we're using something that is 34 years old at this point and and i feel like Wigan needs to die today and any new installation any new greenfield installation 100 percent of the time should be using osdp uh, I, I will have, point out that uh, Jeremy is not making death threats to John Wiegand. Uh, Mr. Wiegand had passed away a, a long time ago. I was only two years old when he died. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so I think uh, for Greenfield Opportunities, it's simple. We have all the pieces. They're ready to go. It makes no sense not to use OSDP. For retrofits, I think we can be strategic and we can focus on areas uh, that need to be more secure than others. And those are the areas that we should update. Um, on the, the controller side, just for the system integrators that are listening in, there's some things that you can do, I think, just as best practices uh, on the controller side. And it's really simple things. It's uh, get rid of the default username and password on the controller and put something that's uh, secure and strong. Um, there's the ability to set IP addresses, so the the controller will only talk to a specific IP address. So if you get some some rogue uh, bad person out there that's that's attempting to hijack that communication with the controller, uh, they wouldn't be able to because they don't have that IP address. There's through the web page of the controller. There's the ability to encrypt all the data on the board called data at rest. We should make sure we do that. So there's some easy things that we can do to really uh, make the solution incredibly secure uh, without really much effort. So I would just encourage everybody to take those steps and really appreciate the time, Phil. And uh, I hope this was beneficial for everybody. So for everybody out there listening in, I think you all have a, a really strong team of people within Genetech and within HID to help solve your problems. And don't be shy to, to reach out to us if needed. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. No, guys, thank you. You know, it's funny. We've been sitting here chatting for, for two hours. You, you get a bunch of industry guys in the room. 
And uh, we could probably go for two, three, four, five more hours, especially if you start getting some adult beverages in our hands. Uh, we could wax poetic about all the different things that we'd like to see in the industry. Maybe that's just maybe that's a future video is, uh, you know, what what the future looks like uh, in the video surveillance access control business. Uh, just to just to tie this whole thing up and put a bow on it. And we had a great conversation about best practices. Uh, I really do think we 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 buried the Wiegand format, not John Wiegand himself, but the Wiegand format in general and why. OSDP is something that should be used, why we should use, you know, if we're talking about best practices, end-to-end -end security, Paul, you put it so well, why we should do that, that's what we've been talking about this whole time. So moving to a secure credential format, um, OSDP on your readers, multi-technology readers that are capable of, you know, seeing you through a migration, security by default on the newer Mercury panels, the LP panels, and, and the capability of doing OSDP only on like the MR62s. And of course, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't throw in a shameless plug for Genetech Security Center for Synergist Access Control, which is secure by design. Um, I'll throw a link down below to uh, to the Synergist page uh, on Genetech.com. But Genetech, especially in the last few years, has taken a leadership role in the security industry. We have this whole initiative called the Security of Security, because like I said earlier, at the end of the day, these are technology devices and why, as an industry, we don't spend more time making sure that these devices are updated so that they're as secure as possible. They're there to secure our facilities, but they are a vector of attack for, for some bad actors. So Genetech Security Center is secure by design. We give you things like the security score, uh, we support OSDP. Uh, there's a there's a ton more stuff, so I'll, I'll throw links for that down below. Guys, thank you so much. I, I know that this was a lot uh, for the folks listening and and watching on YouTube. I know this this was a long one. I hope you got uh, some information uh, that was of value to your organization, whether you're a consultant, integrator, or end user. My name's Phil Coppola. We had Paul, Tim, and Jeremy from the HID team with us, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And uh, for those of you out there, we'll see you on the next one.